Good morning, neighborhood kids and everyone else. I am so glad you are here today for another story from God's Word, which we know is absolutely true and completely trustworthy. We have seen God create our world, fill it with people. He has judged sin. He made a covenant. He's brought people out of Israel, uh, excuse me, out of Egypt and given them the law. We saw in numbers that they spent 40 years in the desert wandering um, because they did not believe God and his covenant. We have also seen under Joshua's leadership that God is fulfilling that covenant to make Abraham a great nation and to give them the land of Canaan. Well, after the Israelites had crossed the Jordan River into the Promised Land, the very first thing they did, even before they conquered Jericho, as we learned last week, they set up camp at a place called Gilgal, and they celebrated Passover. Passover takes us all the way back to their days in Egypt. And if you remember that story, Moses had been sent to Pharaoh and said, let the people of Israel go. And Pharaoh said no, and Moses went back and forth nine times, and Pharaoh kept saying no. And finally, God said, the tenth plague, the tenth judgment on their sin is death, and this is what you're to do. And so God, through Moses, told all the Israelites to kill a lamb and to put its blood on the doorposts of their house. And that night, when God would pass through the land, if the blood of the lamb was on the door, God would pass over. But if there was no blood, then the firstborn male, whether of animals or people in that home, was going to die, die because of sin. You know, that's a beautiful picture of what Jesus does for us. When we believe that Jesus died on the cross for us, that he shed his blood for our sin, then we can be forgiven too. Well, that very night, God brought his people out of Israel. Pharaoh said, get out of here. I want nothing else to do with you. And so they quickly left. Passover was the very last meal that the Israelites ate when they were in Egypt. And now as we are coming into the book of Joshua and they're in the promised land, it's the very first meal that they eat in Canaan. And they were able to eat the fruit of the land, the pomegranates and grapes and the figs. And the very next morning, there was no manna on the ground. First time in 40 years, they did not eat manna. But God had beautifully provided for them. He had fed them every single day for 40 years while they were out in the desert. He is fulfilling his covenant his promise that he will give them this land. And that's what we will see today. Last week, we learned that God was also judging the sin, the wrong things that people say and think and do, of the Canaanites. The Canaanites were the people that lived here in Canaan. And that is the land that God is giving to his people. He wants to give this land to his people, the Israelites, so they can live like devoted fans of God. They can worship him and serve him in the land because he is the one true God. And he is more powerful than all of those little G gods we've talked about that are made of wood and metal and stone that the Canaanites and the Egyptians had worshipped. We saw that the walls of Jericho came tumbling down, except for Rahab's house. God saved her, and she and her family are now part of the Israelites. Well, if you will turn to Joshua chapter 9, we're going to pick up our story today and see how the Israelites conquered the southern part of Canaan. There are a couple really fun stories in here that I'd like to tell you about. Now, the kings of Canaan had heard all about these Israelites and what happened in Egypt and how they're conquering other kings in the land. And that made them very frightened. Some of them started to band together to see if they could attack the Israelites. But there was one group of people. They were actually in the next city closest to Jericho called Gibeon. And they created a ruse, a trick. They tried to deceive the Israelites. They came to see Joshua and the leaders of Israel dressed up in torn, dirty clothes. 
They wore their worst shoes that were falling apart. They brought broken water, wine skins, and they brought moldy bread. And they came to Joshua, and they said, you know, when we left home, our clothes were clean. Our bread was warm, and we had delicious wine to drink. And now look at us. We're a mess. We've come because we have heard what the Lord your God is doing, and we want to make a peace treaty with you. Well, the leaders of Israel looked at them. It says they even sampled their bread, and they did not ask God for wisdom, but they made a peace treaty with the Gibeonites. Three days later, as Joshua and his army, the Israelite army, are out marching to the next city, they come across Gibeon. Gibeon was not far away. It was very close, and they realized they have been tricked. Can you imagine how they felt? They probably felt pretty silly, pretty dumb, maybe really mad. But they honored that treaty, and they did not attack the Gibeonites. Well, there were other kings that heard about what was going on, specifically the king of Jerusalem. And he got together with several other kings and said, we need to do something. I think if we attack those Gibeonite people, that'll hurt the Israelites. And so they made this plan. Well, during the night, the Gibeonites knew what was going on, and they sent a message to Joshua very, very quickly. Joshua, you have to come save us. And so Joshua got the Israelite army together, and it says they marched all night long, 25 miles in hilly country, and they arrived in the morning. And God had told them, you will be victorious. I want you to do it this way. You're going to surprise them in the morning. And so Joshua and the Israelite army surprised this group of kings and their armies. And God also caused a lot of confusion to happen so that these people ran away. And Israel did conquer those kings and their armies. But a very special miracle happened that day that you might have heard about before. Joshua knew that if they did not conquer these kings by the end of the day, that those other army people are going to go home and sleep and be refreshed, and it might be harder the next day. And so he prayed for a miracle. He said, God, would you make the sun stand still? And do you know that God did that? For 24 hours almost, the sun did not move. And Joshua and the Israelite army were able to conquer all of those kings. God had answered in a miraculous way. And as we come to the end of chapter 10 in Joshua, we read that Joshua and the Israelites have conquered all of the area from Kadesh Barnea in the south, where they first camped to go into the promised land, all the way to Gaza, right on the coast, and up to Gibeon and Gilgal, where they had been camped. And then they went back to Gilgal and their families there. You know, Joshua then reminded all of the Israelite people. He gathered them together, and he said, God is doing this. God is with us. We can be strong, we can be courageous, and we are going to be able to conquer this land of Canaan because God will do it for us, just as he has done with these battles this, in these chapters. And you know, God promises to be with us too, just like that. We can be strong, we can be courageous when we face difficult things or hard things, maybe going back to school or back to work, or maybe it's sharing the gospel with a friend or a coworker. God promises to be with us too.